today's lecture is all about software and writing programs. Uh, so I thought maybe a, a good way to start would be to uh, write a little program. So we're going to write a program to control Carol the robot. Uh, Carol was actually designed as a teaching tool to help students how to learn. And I thought it might be a good way to just sort of get you in the mood for the, the talk. So Carol lives in a world uh, surrounded by a wall. And in this uh, case, I've also uh, made a mountain in front of Carol. And we're going to write a program uh, that instructs Carol to climb up and down the mountain to the other side. OK, so that's our goal. Um, you can put it up over there. And uh, the way you write a program is you instruct, in this case, Carol, to perform certain tasks. For example, I can tell Carol to turn left. I can tell Carol to move. I can tell Carol to turn right to follow the red line that I've drawn. And immediately we have a problem. Carol is not the brightest robot. OK? It can turn left. Can't really turn right. It doesn't know what turn right means. Uh, that's not really a problem, though, because turning right in this world is really the same as turning left three times, and I can keep going. Now, it turns out that you know, robots, they need to turn right pretty often. And I don't want to have to say turn left three times every single time I want Carol to turn right. So what I'm going to do is actually define what it means to turn right. So I'm going to define a new instruction that Carol understands in terms of what it already knows. So turn left three times. And now, if I tell Carol to turn right, it actually knows what I'm talking about. Now, I could continue telling Carol to turn left, move, turn right, move, to climb each step. But while we're defining these new operations, since that's something we're going to have to do a lot, why don't we just define what it means to climb a step? So I'll also define climb step. Turn left, move, turn right, move. And if I bring Carol back to the beginning, I can then say climb step. And it does those four instructions to move one step. Uh, also notice I rewrote turn right rather than writing turn left three times. I've introduced what's called a loop. It basically says, for three times, do what's in that body of the loop. So for three times, turn left. Well, we can keep on going. Because if we know how to climb one step, let's define what it mean, means to climb a whole bunch of steps. And this is what programming is all about. It's about taking the small building blocks that a robot can do or a computer can do and building these more sophisticated operations out of those little steps. And we can keep going. Don't worry, there's not a test on Carol the Robot at the end. I can have an entire Climb Mountain program. Oops, I only did climb steps here, so I better uh, let me restep it, reset it. Climb Mountain. And we're going to successfully climb the mountain. Now notice, you know, it's a simple robot. It's a simple problem. I still had to write 20 or 30 lines of code just to make this robot do uh, something interesting. Let's write one more version of this. Descend step. It's kind of the opposite of, of, climb, uh, of climb step. Let's just have it turn right there instead of turn left and see what happens. This is our first software bug. What's a bug? Well, it's when the instructions that the programmer write to control the robot or a computer don't work. When it does something unexpected or leads to a, a consequence that we don't really want, like running into a wall. Now, we encounter bugs in the software we use all the time. And software is actually all around us, right? Laptops, cell phones, projectors, cameras. Virtually any device we use is running software. And I'm sure you've all encountered bugs in some of it. How many recognize this? OK, this is affectionately known as the blue screen of death. This is what happens when there's a mistake in the source code for the Windows operating system that causes a, a computer to fail. Um, this is interesting because you see it in unusual places, airport terminals, other airport terminals, other airport terminals. <laughs> I like to think that good programmers are programming the airplanes. <laughs> but you know, I don't want to pick on the airline industry. Because you see these blue screens of death everywhere.
Here's a more frightening one. This is a USS Yorktown. This is one of the, the first smart ships in the US Navy. Uh, the entire ship was controlled by a network of 27 PCs running Windows. One day an operator entered some data incorrectly which led to a divide by zero error. That's like crashing into a wall. It's gonna crash the, the program. The ship was dead in the water for two hours while they tried to diagnose the problem and fix it. Okay, this is a bit more serious of a bug. This is the Ariane 5 rocket. During one of the early uh, launches, it veered off course almost immediately and had to be detonated. The cause, one line of source code being wrong. That's an $800 million mistake. Okay, so there's real money here too. Right? It's not just minor annoyance, having to install an update, having to recover a file. Uh, software can have major consequences when it doesn't work. Uh, this is the Mars Climate Order Orbiter. We're supposed to go and uh, orbit Mars and relay signals back from the Mars Polar Lander and collect uh, weather information. Um, it's smashed into Mars. Why? Somewhere in the source code, a programmer forgot to convert an English unit to a metric unit. Forgot to convert inches to millimeters, for example. Uh, unfortunate. Turns out not so bad for the Mars Polar Lander, though, because it also smashed into Mars. In this case, while it was descending through the Earth's atmosphere, slowing its descent with a, a rocket, spurious signals from the sensors caused it to think it was already on the surface, and it shut its engine off too early and plummeted to the, the surface. The 2001 power failure that took out power to most of the Northeast for a, a fairly long period of time. You can trace it back to a single mistake in source code in a power plant in Ohio. Okay, one more. One day last year, the Dow dropped by almost 10% in a matter of moments. The root cause? Well, a lot of trading is now done by automated trading software. There were assumptions made in those programs, mistakes in the models that they were using, and also no fail stops in place so that under those particular conditions on that, those days, these programs were allowed to flood the equity markets with sell orders. It basically collapsed the markets instantaneously. Fortunately, it recovered fairly quickly. But hopefully this impresses that there's a huge economic cost to bugs in software. But it gets worse. This is a Therac-25 radiation therapy device to give radiation doses to cancer patients. This is uh, uh, back from the mid-'80s. Uh, a particular kind of bug called a timing bug, which I'll talk a lot more about, allowed the operator to actually give fatal doses of radiation to patients, and, and a couple died as a result. During the first Gulf War, a Patriot missile was launched to intercept an incoming Scud missile. It missed, and that Scud killed 28 people. The reason? There was an incalcula incorrect calculation in the software running on the, the Patriot missile. These are all sort of, uh, you know, this one in particular, is, it's sort of like saying turn left instead of instead of turn right. It's, a, it's a, an actual mistake in the source code that you can point to. But just to highlight that, bugs come in many different forms. Here's one last example. This is the USS Vincennes. It, it shot down an Iranian Airbus that the operators of the vessel mistook for an F-14. Now the reason why the operators mistook it isn't because the software crashed. It just reported a misleading message to the operator who mistook the information that was being given and made an incorrect decision about it. Okay, so software bugs, they come in many guises. There's a huge financial cost, not just convenience, huge uh, uh, you know, cost when they're in critical systems. Nuclear power plants, railways, airplanes. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to build systems that work? Well, there are many reasons. Let me just highlight a couple of them. Let me uh, compare writing Carol the Robot to building the Golden Gate Bridge. If a single rivet in the Golden Gate Bridge fails, the bridge still stands. There's enough redundancy, and the engineering techniques used to build a bridge allow for small failures in individual pieces not to compromise a whole system. When we're having our robot perform a task for us, if it hits a wall, it's done. There is no way to recover from it. Small mistakes in software can have catastrophic consequences in a way that isn't seen in other engineering disciplines such as building uh, bridges. Also, software use in a, is used in a very unpredictable environment. There are all kinds of failures you have to deal with, networks going down, media not working well, hardware failures, user doing unexpected things. If you look at a large code base, over half of the source code is just to handle unusual situations like these. 
It's very hard to predict all of them. It's very hard to test to make sure that you've handled them correctly. It's just a very hard to write reliable software for an unpredictable environment. And finally, these systems are, are too complex for any one individual to understand. So how complex are they? Well, let's look at how big versions of Windows are. Uh, and let's even take sort of what, what by modern standards would be a very simple operating system, Windows 3.1, Windows NT, 10 million lines of code. Windows Vista is over 50 million lines of code. That's a million printed pages of source code. Way too much for any single individual to ever be able to fully understand. Um, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on Microsoft here, because Microsoft actually cares more about software qual quality than just about any other company I know. Uh, here's Linux, a different operating system. There's OS X right up there. This machine, 86 million lines of source code running the operating system. Okay. These are huge, and obviously, there's a trend in these numbers. <laughs> it's not getting any better. So just to impress upon you, uh, in, a, in a slightly different way, how the size of the code base, the how the complexity of the code base affects how much reliability it's going to have. Uh, let me show you this graph, which was constructed by uh, NASA, and it's a predictive model. So given the size of the code running on a satellite, Mars rover, this is the likelihood that it's going to fail due to a software defect on its first deployment. So if you only have 10,000 lines of code, that's pretty tiny, you have a very small chance of it, uh, of software actually causing a fatal error. If you have 100,000 lines of code, this is a log log graph, so if you have 100,000 lines of code, it's a 50-50 chance. If you have a million lines of code, you're going to experience about six critical errors on the first deployment. Here's where some of the earlier Voyager, Galileo, Cassini spacecraft were. Here's where the, par the polar lander, the orbiter, and the two rovers were. Interestingly, two out of four survived. The scary one is that's where the next generation of rovers is. So we have to do something, or else there's no hope that such sophisticated pieces of software are going to function effectively when they're deployed. So let me switch gears a little bit and, and maybe explore that. How do we make software better than it currently is? And I, I see it as a, a combination of three things, the people, the process, and the tools. So let me just uh, talk about each one of them briefly. I'll start with people. Training good software engineers, critically important. Having people who are well-versed in how to write software reliably, not make common mistakes, is essential for building large software. But it's not enough. Training 10 million more people to write software, good software, isn't going to make it any more reliable. This was first observed in a book called The Mythical Man Month from 1975. And the observation is that when designing and building a piece of software, once the software group, the number of people working on the project, reaches a certain size, adding more people to the project doesn't make it finish faster, and it doesn't give you a more reliable product. The overhead of those extra people, the possibilities of misunderstandings between them, communication errors between them, outweighs actually having more eyes looking at the source code and more fingers typing on the, the keyboards. So we're not going to get there just by Microsoft hiring 50,000 more people to work on the next version of Windows. There has to be something else to it. We're also not going to get that much smarter in the next couple hundred years. So we can't imagine a single person or a small group of people understanding software much larger than what we can, we can currently understand. So let me talk about the process. This is how you actually go about organizing a group to sit down and write a piece of software. So uh, compared to maybe the organization of an administration here with the president, provost, dean of college, dean of the faculty, each one has a role. Each one has a particular mode of interacting with other people at the college, of communicating ideas and decisions. Basically, a, a software process says who's responsible for what and how people interact. If a bug is found, who do you report it to? Who makes sure it got fixed correctly? The benefits of having a good process in place, you avoid miscommunication, misunderstandings. You can recognize problems earlier when they're easier to fix. You can better predict the time and cost to build software. Uh, you might have noticed a few slides ago, the price tag on Windows Vista was between eight and $10 billion. Um, it's good to know that ahead of time before you start writing the piece of software. Uh, process failures happen all the time. A good example is in 1983, the government 
put out to bid a complete revamping of the air traffic control system for the country. A number of large defense contractors and commercial contractors bid on it and started building it. Over the next 13 years, the government spent two and a half billion dollars on the system and then it was canceled without a single working piece. And it was canceled because these different organizations, these different companies just could not effectively communicate together and get on the same page about the overall design. Basically, they couldn't build pieces that fit together well. It's a failure in process. So let me walk you through one basic software process just to, again, give you a feel for what it's actually like. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about the waterfall model. And suppose that I'm a software company and Williams hires me to put the grading system into PeopleSoft. The first thing we're gonna do is sit down and talk about the requirements for the software. What's it supposed to do? Okay, well, we should store all student grades, we should be able to search based on student name, be able to find the student with the highest GPA, prevent unauthorized access, and so on. We wanna list all of the things the software is supposed to do. Once we've written that down, then we can go and start designing it. We identify the big pieces of the software. A database to store information, an authentication mechanism to check passwords, a user interface to enter data, and so on. Now at this point, what we do is we take each one of those individual pieces and maybe hand it off to a different group of people to write. That is, we implement each one of these large pieces of the system separately from each other. We don't build everything all at once, we build them as separate pieces because it's easier to understand and test these smaller pieces of software and make sure they're working before we try to integrate them. So we go off, maybe there are three groups that, that work on this. So um, let's, uh, let's think about a, a slightly simpler thing than searching for the highest of the student GPA. I'm gonna give you a list of numbers and we wanna find the biggest number out of that list, okay? So in programming, lists of numbers are often stored in arrays, so here's an array. Five, uh, six numbers, one, two, two, three, one, zero. The blue numbers are called the index into the array. It's the position the number is at. So the index of the largest number in array A is three. The index of the largest number in array B is two. We wanna write the code that does that. So here's the algorithm, and then we'll actually look about it and test it and think about how, how it fits into the big picture. Here's the algorithm. With my left hand, I point to index zero. With my right hand, I look at every other index, one, two, three, four, five in order. And every time my right hand is pointing to a larger number than what's under my left hand, I move my left hand. Two is bigger than one, two is not bigger than two, three is bigger than two, one is smaller, zero is smaller. What's under my left hand at the end is the biggest number. Same thing down here. Four is bigger than two, six is bigger than four, four is not bigger than six, so I leave my left hand here and I find it. Let's, um, Let's write that, so over here I can put up that algorithm. So biggest, that was my left hand. Store is the index of the biggest value I've seen so far. I'm gonna scan through the data, changing biggest whenever I see a bigger value and then return that index. So here's my code, define a new operation that's gonna take an array of data. I'm gonna use one of my loops, i is, counts from zero up to the length. We're computer scientists, we start counting at zero. If data i less than biggest, change biggest, after the loop finishes, I return biggest. Okay, so that's a decent first cut. Let's test it on my array a. Index of max a. Okay, that's not three. <laughs> I'll give you this one. So, oops, I forgot to say what biggest starts at. I forgot to say put my left hand at index zero. It just happened to use whatever was lying around in the computer's memory. Okay, so biggest equals zero, I fixed one bug. Zero. Okay, that's still not three. Now, the green says change biggest whenever I see a larger value. But here it says change biggest whenever I see a smaller value. So let me just uh, do that. Okay, three, good. Well, let's look at B. Okay, still not quite so, so good. Anyone see the? The problem? Right. Right, so biggest is the index of the largest value. So I need to say, if data at position i is bigger than the data at position or index biggest. And now I got it, bonus points for Nick. So what is the moral of this little example? Well, we wrote the code. We tested it for a while, everything seemed great. 
wasn't quite right yet. It's really hard to test software. It's really hard to know when you've written enough test cases and tried it enough to know that there's not going to be a bug when you try a different array of numbers. Okay? So as hard as we try to write these pieces separately in the implementation and unit testing phase, some things are going to creep through. Well, once we've done our best job possible here, then we do the integration system testing. This is when we put everything together and run it as a single system. So in this phase, we might recognize that maybe the database was storing grades as numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The interface was accepting grades as A, B, C, D. And somewhere we forgot to convert letter grades to numeric grades. It's sort of like converting English units to metric units. That's where we identify this kind of mistake. It involves more than one piece of the system, and we don't see it until we put everything together. And again, we keep testing it and trying to find as much as we can. And at some point, we say, we're done, version one, ship it. And we switch into maintenance mode. And maybe we start talking about version two. OK? So that's a basic software model. Let me mention a couple things about it. The first, the cost to fix bugs grows enormously as you go down the chain. It's very easy to fix a misunderstanding with the client when you're talking about the requirements. It's a phone call. It's an email message. It's easy to recognize when the test of something like our index of masks function fails and to fix it while we're working on that piece of source code. It's harder when there are more groups involved or different components of the system involved. More people, larger code base, harder to understand what's going on. It's really expensive if a million people are using it or your missile just blew up. Okay, so we want to find bugs as early as possible in this process. Now, I said that we're never going to find everything, no matter how good our process is. This graph kind of reflects that. It's, it's this thing called the capability maturity model. It's basically a measure of how good your software process is, how rigidly, how carefully you manage the project, versus how many bugs are going to be per thousand lines of code at the end. And there's sort of five levels of how good your process is. So we, you know, chaotic is the worst. So think, you know, like the movie The Social Network, when Mark Zuckerberg and her friends, he's sitting around, they're writing the first version of Facebook's, drinking beer, smoking various things. Not a good software process. You might, you might ship something. It might roughly work. Seven to eight bugs per thousand lines of code. Optimizing is the other extreme. These are people who care deeply. When something goes wrong, they figure out why, they fix it, and they also fix the process that let it go through. This is NASA, this is Microsoft, Oracle, Airbus, Boeing. It's still one bug per thousand lines. Now some of these will be, you know, the, the button was the wrong shade of gray, or an error message had a typo in it. But other ones are gonna be blue screen of death. Okay, so one bug per thousand lines of code, Windows Vista, 50 million lines of code. That's a big number. So let me talk about the last one, tools. This is what, where I do my research. And by tools, what I mean are computer programs to automatically find bugs in software for us. We have an enormously powerful computing device sitting here. Let's use it to try to find the bugs. So I want to write a tool that someone can give the source code for Microsoft Office or the source code for the Mars rover or some program and have the tool automatically find where the defects are. Okay. So here's what, an example of a kind of defect, and I'll talk about how we might design such a tool. Um, so uh, suppose that I want to authenticate a user. I might see some code like this in a program. Name equals a new character array. So instead of numbers, now we're storing characters out of the alphabet or letters out of the alphabet. So I get these pink boxes here, enough boxes to store eight letters. I get a string that the user types into a dialog box, and then I use this authentication operation that somebody else wrote for me to see whether or not the user is allowed to, to access whatever we're, we're doing here. Now, if I type my last name in, great. Fits in the pink boxes. Everything looks good. But what if I type in purple cows? More than eight letters. Depending on what programming language you're using, how you're designing the system, one of the things that might happen is you fill up the pink boxes and then you fill up some of the blue boxes. And what are the blue boxes? They're memory locations that the computer is using to store other data for you. 
your bank account balance, your credit card, your password. Maybe not, but probably something bad if you replace it with the letter OWS, the letters OWS. It basically, we've corrupted the memory of your program by filling in too many of these boxes. Now, this is actually a pretty common uh, bug in certain types of software, especially operating systems, where they don't bother to check to make sure you have enough space just for efficiency reasons. Um, it's also a kind of bug that leads to a lot of security attacks. People figure out what to put in here that will allow them to gain access to your machine. So it would be nice if we could find these things. So why don't we write what's called a source code checker or a static checker that inspects the source code for a program and says, yep, good program, no buffer overruns, or, you know, bad program, it's going to have a buffer overrun in it if you give it the wrong input. All right, basically we want to take the source code and say it's good or it's bad. We want to sort of divide the world of programs into these two pieces. Sounds awesome. Probably wondering, well, why don't we do that? Well, there is a catch. It's impossible. No computer algorithm, that is no program I wrote, write, can precisely compute whether a program is good or bad. We can't write a program to determine whether a source code is going to have a buffer overrun in it. In other words, computers cannot compute everything for us. There are questions we would love to know, to know the answer for, and there's no way to compute them. This all comes from what's called the undecidability of the halting problem. But for us, the important thing is, I can't write a tool to distinguish the good from the, the bad ex exactly. So what we're left with is designers trying to find bugs in source code is an approximation. I'm going to say, well, we have verifiable programs that I can prove to you, that my tool can prove are going to be free of defects, and those I'll let through. Those I'll let you ship. And then everything else, I'm going to say, eh, you know, maybe it works, but I cannot verify it for a fact. And we're going to say that those are not verifiable programs. So we run our program, our checker, on the Microsoft Windows source code. It could be verifiable, which is great. Our tool succeeded in proving it's free of buffer overruns. Or it could say it's not verifiable. And we're left wondering whether it's a bad program or a bad tool. Okay. And that's really the crux here. A lot of programs people write and want to be able to run are that green area in between the bad and what we can verify. Right? There are programs that we'd love to say, yep, this is a good program, but our checkers are not sufficiently powerful enough to be able to prove it without a shadow of a doubt. We know we're never going to get exactly that distinguishing between good and bad, but my goal is to build tools that make the verifiable programs as large of a subset of the good ones as possible without ever letting through a bad program. Okay? So that's a source code checker. Catches bugs if we can verify programs and not verify them effectively. But we're always going to have to reject some good programs because we can't do a perfect job at it. So that's one technique for building a, a checking tool. Another is to just run the program and monitor what it does as it runs. That is, look at every memory operation, every access to every array in the program. And if we ever see it access an array out of bounds, we stop it at that moment and say, oh, bug right here. Now, this is better than testing alone. You might not know you've overwritten a, bad, a, a value with something bad until much later when you try to use it. Or you won't know that you overwrote your bank account balance until 20 minutes later when you display it on the screen. But my tool can tell you the moment you overwrite it. OK, so this is still good. We can find errors faster than just by testing. But we only find what happens when you test it, meaning if there's a case for handling a network failure, and you never experience a network failure during testing, you're not going to exercise that code. There might be something lurking in there you just didn't see during testing. So we don't get the same kind of coverage that we had before. And also, there are performance issues with dynamic checkers. If I let you find bugs faster, but your program runs 10,000 times slower while we check it, no programmer is going to be patient enough. So we build dynamic checkers that observe the internals of programs and try to find defects as they occur. And these are the trade-offs. How do we do that efficiently? How do we make sure that we're sort of at least telling the program what kind of coverage they're getting and what kind of guarantee our tool is giving them? Okay, so that's sort of a 
a basic overview of source code checking, dynamic checking. Now what I do in my research is we pick a kind of bug, buffer overrun, bad unit conversion. We say we want to build a checker for this. And we explore the, oper oper uh, the, the different possibilities. Do we want to use the source code or a compiled program? How precise is it going to be? That is, are we going to have to report spurious warnings that the programmer is going to have to look at and understand? Will it scale to millions of lines of code? Will it be usable? Will it report good error messages when it does recognize something bad? These all go into how you might design one of these program checking tools. Once we've implemented it, then we actually validate them by going out and checking real software, web servers, parts of operating systems, and try to identify defects. Okay? And in doing that, maybe we see that our analysis is flawed in some way, and we go back and have to redesign it. Or maybe we find another kind of interesting bug to go off and pursue. But it's this escalating arms race of finding a kind of bug, building tools to try to check it, and then figuring out how to improve the, the tools to do a better job at it. So that's sort of the, the big picture of my research area, this idea of building tools to leverage computers to find bugs in other uh, pieces of software. Um, let me finish the talk with um, talking about a kind of bug I've actually spent the last 10 or 11 years building analyses for. Um, let me start by uh, uh, just describing what's actually uh, the, the core idea of this, this computer scene in, in front of me here. I mean, if we tore it apart and distilled it down to its essence, this is what we get. We have a central processing unit and memory, which are the, the big array of boxes on the left, the big array of memory locations, stored with bits, zeros and ones. Now those bits are the data that our programs use. So some of those bits represent letters out of the alphabet, numbers for our counting loops, coordinates for our robot simulator, all of that data that our programs manipulate. And other parts of memory store the instructions that represent the programs we want to run. So for example, the instructions store the value zero at memory location two. Compare the, memory, the value at memory location three to the value five. And if the value at that memory location is greater than five, go to instruction number 13 as the next instruction to execute. These instructions are sort of the building blocks. They're the turn left in the move of the processor. It's, it's what the processor knows how to do. Read a value from memory, write a value from memory, execute one of these tiny instructions. Now as a programmer, you don't write these instructions. You write code that looks a lot more like what we've been doing before. So here's just a little example of summing up the first five numbers. And we use a, another program called a compiler to translate that, that loop, that, that counting loop, into these little instructions that the processor understands. Okay, but deep down inside, all a processor does is execute these little simple instructions that have some effect on memory. Reading a value out, writing a value to memory, adding two numbers together, comparing numbers, and so on. Now that processor, it's really the key. And over the last 30, 40, 50 years, there have been dramatic increases in what these processors are able to do. So the very earliest processors, they weren't very powerful. Those instructions that they could do weren't uh, all that sophisticated. And they ran kind of slow. We can compare this processor on the left from 1971 to this one. And you know, even without looking very hard, the one on the right looks a lot more complicated. And it is. It's much more efficient. The instructions that it can execute are much richer. They can do many more things for us. And more importantly, we can run these processors at a much higher clock speed. That is, we can execute many more instructions per second on the chip from 2000 than we could before. In fact, if we look at the the graph of processor clock speed. So when you hear you know, a Pentium running at two gigahertz, that means it can execute two billion little instructions per second. Okay, so in 1973, a one megahertz chip was a fast processor. And notice, that, again, this is a log graph. Every 18 months, processor speeds doubled. So in a year and a half, you could get a machine that was twice as fast or a processor twice as fast as the last generation. By the time we were around uh, 2000, you know, a gigahertz machine was fairly common. And now you know, we have two gigahertz, two and a half gigahertz. But notice that something else happened around 2000. Okay, we're not getting five gigahertz, 10 gigahertz processors. 
our processors aren't increasing in speed as fast as they used to. And what's happened is we've hit what's called the power wall. So let me uh, draw an analogy here. You have a 20 watt light bulb. It produces some small amount of light and as a pro byproduct produces some heat. You take it out, you put in a 200 watt light bulb. It's a lot brighter, but it produces a lot more heat as a byproduct. The same thing happens as you increase the processor speed. You can execute more instruction per second, but as a byproduct, you generate a lot more heat. You, I should say you also use a lot more energy. Right, a 200, or a two gigahertz chip might be 100 watts, 150 watts. You probably don't want that in your iPhone in your pocket. Right, first of all, the battery will last a few moments and it's also gonna be very hot. It's gonna generate a lot of heat. Basically, we're hitting the point where you can't dissipate heat fast enough. If you clocked or ran these processors at any higher clock speeds, they'd burn themselves up, okay? So, manufacturers, hardware manufacturers, they had to come up with a different tact for how to improve performance. So now what you do is you build a chip that looks like this. So this is one of the most recent ones from Intel called a Core i7. This is a multi-core chip. What is a multi-core chip? Well, it's a processor where instead of having one CPU on it running at a very high clock speed, you have four simpler ones. Maybe not running quite as fast, their capabilities might not be quite as sophisticated, but you've got four of them. And the important thing is, you can run these four processors at a decent clip without the same kind of power issues coming up. Well, what are the consequences? Processors aren't getting any faster, but now I've got four of them. So if I'm writing Photoshop, or I should say, uh, another way to think about it is, uh, we now have four cores in our processor, all reading and writing to memory, all executing instructions at the same time. So if I'm writing Photoshop, and I'm writing the transformation to brighten an image, I'll divide the image into four pieces, and I'll let each core process one of the four quadrants of the image. That's a lot better than having one processor do all of it, roughly four times faster. If I'm Amazon, I can have many what are called worker threads, or, or many programs running on a server, all on a different core, all processing requests at the same time. One box can handle many requests simultaneously, and we get much better throughput than if we only had a single core processor, an old, old school processor sitting there. Or if I'm a bank, my server can be processing requests from different uh, uh, bank branches, ATM machines, the web. Now, this example is interesting because there's money involved. So let's, uh, let's switch to my bank simulator here. So here's my bank simulator. I have a bank account, the balance is $500. And let's say I have two web browsers open, and simultaneously, I'm gonna withdraw $100 and deposit $100 in my two web browsers. On the server, there are gonna be two of these worker threads running on different cores, doing those operations to my, my bank account. So in this little simulator I have here, every time I hit run, there are gonna be two threads running on, on two, two of the cores up here. One's gonna be adding 100, one's gonna be subtracting 100. So if I hit run, you know, it happens so fast you don't even really notice, but you, know, you get 100 more, 100 less, you're back at 500. And everything looks pretty good. So let me click that. So now I'm using these counting loops again. 10,000 times at 100, 10,000 times subtract 100. What should my balance be at the end? 500. That's not 500. This is not a bank you want to use. It was for a while. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So, yeah, sometimes you lose. Let's see. Uh, this is the bank you want to use. There is something weird happening here. So let's, let's figure this out. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite this program slightly to, effect, to, to, to be more like what the processor actually does in its little in instructions, right? I wrote it in this, 
this high level language, this nice language that has loops and everything. But in reality, that one line, balance equals balance plus 100, the processor has to execute in two steps. Read a value from memory, write the updated value back. Okay, there are two distinct steps happening there. And the same thing down here. Read a value from memory, subtract 100 and write it back as two instructions at the processor level. Okay? Let's see what the implications of that are. Well, sometimes the red thread is going to take the first step. It's going to be the first one to reach into memory and grab a value. It's going to get 500 for the, the, the account balance. It's going to store back 600. Then the blue thread reads that value and writes back 600 minus 100. T2 equals balance, T2 equals 600, and then balance equals 600 minus 100. And most of the time, that's what happens. These different cores are running instructions. The effects on memory are sort of interleaved from these different little uh, programs running different cores. And most of the time, this is the interleaving of the steps from the two threads. But every now and then, the red thread reads balance. The blue thread reads balance. The red thread updates balance. T1 was 500, so we write back 600. And then the blue thread updates balance. But T2 was 500. So I subtract 100, and I'm left with 400. In essence, we kind of forgot about the fact that balance changed between when I read it in the blue thread and when I updated it. OK, that's bad. This means that you, when you're running a program on one of these multi-core chips, can't predict what the outcome's going to be. You know, that's not a good property for a bank. Now, fortunately, there are ways in which we can design our program, that is, programming, feature, programming language features that we can use to make sure that these two threads aren't allowed to interleave their steps in this way. So let me tell you about one of those. Um, let me first say, before I do, this is called a race condition. After the red thread takes one step, depending on which thread goes next, you get a final answer. That's what I meant by sort of a, you know, there's a non-deterministic quality to the bank, or you're not going to be able to predict what happens later. Uh, so we're going to use a programming language feature, a way of programming to avoid these race conditions. And um, let me uh, describe it by way of analogy to the Lord of the Flies. Okay, so the boys on the island had meetings, and in order to maintain civility in these meetings, uh, they had a rule. They had a conch, a big shell, and you were only allowed to speak to the group when you held, held the shell. If you wanted to speak and someone else held the shell, you had to patiently wait for them to release it. You could then take it and address the audience. Okay? Think of updating the balance field like as speaking to the group. What we need to do is grab the shell before we update balance. Now, computer scientists don't call them shells. We call them mutual exclusion locks. But the same thing applies. What we need to do, the protocol to follow, is grab or acquire the lock that gives us permission to touch that piece of data. When we're done touching that data, we release the lock so that another thread that wants to change it can acquire the lock, change it, and then release it. So what I've done here is I've added to my two threads those steps. Before touching balance, acquire M. M is just the name I'm using for my shell, the mutual exclusion lock protecting balance. Acquire M, read balance, write balance, release M, the same thing down here. Now, just like with a shell, two people can't hold a lock. Two people can't hold a shell at the same time. Two threads can't hold this lock at the same time. If a thread tries to acquire M and another thread is currently holding M, that other thread has to sit and wait. And is just stuck waiting there until M is released. Then it can grab it and go on. So in essence, these are the only two ways in which those two pieces of code can have their memory operations interleaved. If the red thread acquires the lock first, it gets to go, it releases M, 
then the blue thread can acquire n and update balance and release it. And we're gonna be left with 500. That's a good interleaving of the memory operations. If the blue thread gets m first, we have what's on the right here and we're gonna end up with 500 again. Okay, so this is a way of making sure that only one thread is ever accessing that resource, that variable at any given time. If I go back to my bank account and I add that synchronization code around it, then no matter how many times I hit run, we're always gonna get back to 500, okay? So this is great. We've avoided the race condition in this piece of code. Uh, just to um, mention a couple of things. If we have lots of accounts, right? We don't just have one bank account in our bank server. We have lots, well, two. My checking account and my savings account. I can associate a different shell or a different lock with each one of those accounts so that I could have one thread working on my checking account and one thread working on my savings account at the same time. That's totally fine. We still can have things running concurrently. We can still exploit those cores. It's only when we have two threads trying to access the same account at the same time that one of them gets stuck waiting. And this, this, this way of structuring code, this use of locks, it applies to many situations as well, not just these single variables. For example, you have a printer on the network. You have to have some way of making sure that two printers aren't printing at exactly the same time. You could use one of these locks. Okay, there are many resources that your pr computers use, you know, files on the operating system. You don't want to have two programs accessing or changing the same file at the same time. We can use one of these locks to control access and make sure only one program is accessing it uh, in the same way. So we have lots of accounts, we can have lots of locks, Everything seems great. There's this one issue. What happens if a programmer forgets to acquire a lock? Well. Well, you know, drinks are on me, but <laughs> We're back to the case where things aren't working so well because we're back to a situation in which we have that bad pattern of access. Thread one holds the lock. It should be the only thread accessing the variable. But B's not playing by the rules and sneaks in there and reads balance and updates it in a way inconsistent with the way we want the program to work. All right, so Lord of the Flies did not end well. But that's where I come in. Because what I do is I build checking tools to make sure that if you're accessing a variable, you hold the correct lock. In other words, what I do is I say good programs are programs that always acquire the proper lock before accessing the variable. That is, they always play by this protocol that I set out for accessing shared resources. Bad programs, they access a variable without holding the lock properly, like on the last slide. Now we build static tools to do this with all the limitations and all the trade-offs of we can't do a perfect job, but we try to check as many programs as we can and validate them. Uh, we have scalability issues. Can we actually check a five, you know, 50 million line program? Not so much, that's why it's research. We have dynamic checkers. They work pretty well. There's more hope of having these actually integrated into development chains on the dynamic side just because they're so much easier to use. Uh, for example, uh, Microsoft and NASA both use checking tools to find this kind of bug in software. But uh, that's what I do. So let me uh, uh, thank the Faculty Lecture Series Committee for inviting me. It's been a, a pleasure to, to tell you uh, what I do. Uh, I should recognize the National Science Foundation for paying the bills and um, uh, my, my colleagues, Cormac Flanagan and Chaz Kadir, uh, for many years of uh, interesting collaboration. And of course, the, the students who've actually helped me build and validate some of these checkers uh, this crowd contains one current undergrad, two grad students, a performance artist, a lawyer, and a comedian. So I'll let you um, <laughs> figure it out. But thank you for your attention.